Stone Butch Blues, Chapter 5 Hey kid, what's up? May called out as she wiped down the bar. Familiar faces softened as they welcomed me. I had become a regular at ABBA's. Hey Meg, give me a beer, will ya? Sure kid, coming right up. I sat down next to Edwina. Hey Ed, can I buy you a beer? Yeah, she laughed. Why would I say no? It was Friday night, I had money in my pocket, and I was feeling fine. Hey, what about me? Butch Jan laughed. And a beer from my elder, Meg. Hey, watch that elder shit, Jan said. I felt a hand on my shoulder. Judging from the length and the red-painted nails, it had to be peaches. Hi, honey. She kissed me gently on the ear. I sighed with pleasure. And a drink for peaches, I called out to Meg. Child, you're in one damn good mood tonight, Peaches said. You get lucky with some girl or something? I blushed. She had hit a sore spot. I just feel so damn good. I got a job and a motorcycle and friends. Ed whistled. You got a bike? Yes, I shouted. Yes, yes. Tony sold me her old Norton. We went out to the supermarket parking lot Sunday and I practiced till she got mad and went home without me. Ed smiled. Wow, big bike. She slapped my open palm. Jesus said, you know what I did after I registered at downtown yesterday? I mean, when I actually realized it was mine? I got on that bike and I rode it 200 miles out and 200 miles back. Everyone roared. I nodded. Something happened to me. I finally felt really free. I'm so excited. I love that bike. I mean, I actually love it. I love that bike so fucking much. I can't even complain, explain it. All the butches who rode motorcycles nodded to themselves. Jan and Edwin clapped me on my shoulders. Things are looking up for you, kid. I'm happy for you, Jan said. Meg, set up another one for young Marlon Brando here. The ring must be working. The Avengers on yet? I asked. Meg shook her head. Fifteen more minutes, God. I can't wait to see what Deanna Riggs wearing this time. I sighed. I hope it's the leather jumpsuit again. I think I'm falling in love with her. Meg laughed. Get in line. The place was starting to fill up. A young guy we'd never seen before came in and ordered a gin and tonic. Meg had just placed the glass in front of him when an older guy came in, flipped open a badge. Uniformed cops rushed in behind him. The young guy was a plant. You just served a minor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, leave your drinks on the bar and take out some ID. This is a bust. Jan and Edwin each grabbed a handful of my shirt and dragged me out the back door. Out of here, now, get out of here. They were yelling as I fumbled with my motorcycle. A couple of cops fanned out around the parking lot. My legs felt like jelly. I couldn't kickstart the bike. Get the fuck out of here, they shouted at me. Two uniformed cops headed toward me. One reached for his gun. Off the bike, he ordered. Come on, come on, I crooned to myself. One good kick, and the bike roared to life. I popped the clutch and did an unintentional wheelie out of the parking lot. As soon as I got to Tony and Betty's house, I banged on the kitchen door. Betty looked alarmed. What's wrong? The bar, everyone there's busted. Calm down, Tony put her hands on my shoulders. Calm down and tell us what happened. I sputtered as I described the bust. How can we find out what happened to everybody, I asked them. We'll find out soon enough when that phone rings, Betty said. The phone rang. Betty listened quietly. Nobody got busted except Meg, she told us. Butch, Jan, and Ed got roughed up a little. I rubbed my forehead with my hand. Are they hurt bad? She shrugged. I felt guilty. I think they got it worse because they got me out of there. Betty leaned on the kitchen table and held her head in both hands. Tony went to the refrigerator. Want a beer, kid? Nah, thanks, I told Tony. Suit yourself. Fear nagged at me as I fell asleep that evening. But the real terror didn't surface until I woke up in the middle of the night. I sat bolt upright, soaking wet, remembering the bust at Tefica's. I had grown an inch or two since then. The next time the police got their hands on me, my age wouldn't save me. Fear boiled, boiled in the back of my throat. It was going to happen to me. I knew it. But I couldn't change the way I was. It felt like driving toward the edge of a cliff and seeing what was coming and not being able to break. I wished Al was, Al was around. I wished Jacqueline would tuck me in on their couch, kiss my forehead, and tell me everything would be all right. The owner of Abba's had been so deeply in debt a couple of years ago that he had to hand carry in beer by case. The mob wouldn't allow deliveries until he paid up, so he put out the word that there was a bar going gay. He'd made money hand over fist off us. 
We were a lucrative and captive market. Usually only one club was open to us at a time. Other owners wanted our business for a while, but Abba's owner got greedy, so the mob had him, had him busted and shut down. The new bar was closer to the Tenderloin Strip in downtown Buffalo. It was called the Malibu, a jazz bar that would welcome us after the 1 o'clock a.m. show ended. Organized crime owned the Malibu, too, but a lesbian ran it. We figured that it would make a difference. Her name was Gert. She wanted us to call her Auntie Gertie, but it made us feel like a Girl Scout troop, so we called her Cookie. The new club had a bigger dance floor, but it only had one exit. It did have a pool table, though, and Edwin and I played for hours till the sun came up. Ed waited for her girlfriend Darlene until dawn. Darlene danced nearby at the bar at Chippewa Street, just down the block from the Malibu, was a hotel where a lot of the pros, female and male, used to take their tricks. At dawn, all the working girls got off their shifts and filled the Malibu, which never seemed to close, or went to a restaurant near the bus station for breakfast. I began to notice sometimes Ed didn't come in on weekends. What else was there in life besides the plants and the bars? Hey, Ed, I asked her one morning. Where were you last weekend? She looked up from the pool shot she was lining up at a different club. Her answer surprised me. There was only one club open at a time, as far as I knew. Yeah, I asked. Where? On the east side, she said, chalking up. You mean it's a negro club? Black, she said, as she whacked the high ball and sunk it. It's a black club. I took in all the new information as Ed lined up her next shot. Shit, she said as she missed it. Is it different from this club? I asked as I surveyed the table. Yes and no. Ed wasn't giving up much this morning. I shrugged and indicated the far corner. I missed the shot. Ed smiled and patted me on the back. I had a lot of questions, but I didn't know how to ask. Edwin sunk the eight ball by mistake. Shit, she hissed. Shit. She looked me up and down. What, she demanded. I shrugged. Look, she said, I work all day with these old bulls at the plant. I like coming in here and spending some time with y'all, but I like being with my own people too. You understand? Besides, Darlene and I wouldn't last a month if I hung out on the east side. I shook my head. I didn't understand. Darlene doesn't worry about me being here. If I spend this much time at my own clubs, well, let's just say that would be too much temptation. You hungry? I asked her. Nah, man, I'm just human. She sounded defensive. I laughed. No, I mean, you want to get some breakfast? She slapped me on the shoulder. Let's go. We met Darlene and the other girls at the restaurant. They were all excited, something about a fight with a customer that all the girls jumped into. Hey, Ed, I asked her over coffee as Darlene reenacted her role in the brawl. You think I could go with you sometime? I mean, I don't know if it's okay to ask or not. Ed looked taken aback. Why? Why do you want to go to my club? I don't know, Ed. You're my friend, you know. She shrugged. So? So this morning I realized how much of you I don't know. That's all. I guess I'd like to meet you on your own turf. Darlene tugged on Ed's sleeves. Baby, you should have been there. We kicked this guy's ass all the way to kingdom come. He was begging us for mercy. I've got to think about it. I don't know, Ed said. Fair enough. Just asking. Ed stopped coming to the Malibu soon afterward. I asked Grant what was up, but all she said was that Ed had a chip on his shoulder ever since Malcolm X was killed in New York City. I wanted to call Ed and talk to her, but Meg told me not to. She told me the butchers at the auto plant said Ed was real angry and it was best to just leave her alone. That didn't feel right to me, but the advice had come down from the old bulls, so I listened. It was springtime when I finally ran into Ed at the diner. I was so happy to see her, I reached out my arms to hug her. She eyed me guardedly, as though examining me for the first time. I feared she wouldn't like what she saw. After a moment, she opened her arms to me. Hugging her felt like coming home. Ed started coming back to the Malibu. Out of the blue one morning, she said, I thought about it. Funny how I knew exactly what she meant about me going to the club without her. I don't know how I'd feel about taking you, you know? But next Saturday night is the anniversary party for two women. One of them is white. I don't know. I thought if you wanted to go. I did. We decided to take Ed's car. On Saturday night, Ed picked me up late. 
We rode in silence. You nervous? She asked me. I nodded. She snorted and shook her head. Maybe this was a mistake. No, I told her. Not for the reason you think. I've always scared before I go to a new club. Any club. You ever feel that way? No, Edwin said. Well, yes, maybe. I don't know. You nervous, Ed? About going to the club with a white butch, I mean? Yeah, maybe a little, she said as she checked the rearview mirror. Ed stepped up the, stopped at the red light and offered me a cigarette. I like you, though, you know. I looked out the car window and smiled. I like you too, Ed, a lot. I realized I'd hung out on the edge of the black community with friends after school, but I'd never been deep in the heart of the east side. Buffalo is like two cities, I said. I've had a lot of white people never even been to this city. Ed laughed bitterly and nodded. Segregation is alive and well in Buffalo. That's it, Ed nodded, pointing to the building. Where? You'll see. Ed parked the car on a nearby side street. We approached the door. Ed knocked hard, and I appeared at the peephole. As the door opened, waves of loud music flowed over us. The joint was packed wall to wall. A lot of butches immediately came over to welcome Ed and shook her hand and hugged her shoulders. She gestured towards me and shouted something in their ears, but it was too loud for her to hear much. Several women beckoned us to share their table, and each shook my hand as I sat down. Ed ordered us a beer and sat down next to me. Daisy's already got her eye on you, Ed yelled in my ear, the woman sitting directly across the dance floor from us in a blue dress. She's checking you out. I smiled at Daisy. She dropped her eyes and then boldly met mine. After a few minutes, she whispered something to her girlfriend and stood up. She was wearing a blue spike heels that matched her dress. With a steady step, she made her way directly to our table. Lord have mercy on your soul, girl, Ed shouted at me as I rose to meet Daisy. Daisy put out her hand and tugged me toward the dance floor. Edwin grabbed my other hand and pulled me down near her ear. Are you still uptight? She yelled. I'm adjusting, I shouted back over my shoulder. I don't believe you back there, Ed said to me hours later after we left the club. I'm adjusting. She mimicked me with a laugh and punched my shoulder. Girl, you're just lucky that Daisy's ex wasn't there. She would have kicked your motherfucking white ass. She was interrupted by a hand on her shoulder that spun her around. I was pushed hard from behind. When I turned, I caught a glimpse of a cop car with both doors open. The cops were pushing us with their nightsticks. I up against the wall, girls. They pushed me into the alley. Ed put her hand on the back of my shoulder as reassurance. Keep your hands to yourself, bull dagger, one cop yelled as he slammed her against the wall. Even as I was shoved against the brick wall, I could still feel the comfort of her hand as it had briefly touched my shoulder. Spread your legs, girls, wider. One of the cops grabbed a handful of my hair and jerked my head backward as he kicked my legs apart with his boot. He took my wallet out of my back pocket and opened it. He looked over at Ed. The cop was patting her down and running his hand up her thigh. He pulled out her wallet out from her pocket, took out the money, and stuffed it in his own pocket. Eyes straight ahead, the cop behind me had his mouth close to my ear. The other cop began shouting at Ed. You think you're a guy, huh? You think you can take it like a guy? We'll see. What's these? He yanked up her shirt and pulled her binder down around her waist. He grabbed her breast so hard she gasped. Leave her alone, I yelled. Shut up, you fucking pervert, the cop behind me shouted and bashed my face against the wall. I saw a kaleidoscope of colors. Ed and I spun around and looked at each other for a split second. Funny, it seemed as though we had plenty of time to consult. There are times, the old bulls told me, when it's best to take your beatings in hopes the cops will leave you on the ground when they're done with you. Other times, your life may be in danger, or your sanity, and it's worth it to try to fight back. It's a tough call. In the blink of an eye, Ed and I decided to fight. We had punched and kicked the nearest cop. For just a moment, things started looking up for us. I kicked the cop in front of me in the shins, over and over again. Ed got the other cop in the groin and was hitting him in the head with both her fists. As one cop lunged at me, the point of his nightstick caught me squarely in the, so squarely in the solo plexus. I crashed against the wall, unable to breathe. Then I heard a sickening thud as a nightstick connected with Ed's skull. I vomited. The cops beat us until I found myself wondering through the pain why they weren't 
exhausted from the effort. Suddenly, were heard voices nearby shouting. Come on, one cop said to the other. Ed and I were on the ground. I could see the boot of the cops standing over me pull back. You fucking traitor, he spat as his boots cracked my ribs for punctuation. The next thing I remembered was a light glowing in the sky beyond the alley. The pavement felt cold and hard against my cheeks. Ed was lying next to me, her face turned away. I stretched out my fingers to touch her, but I couldn't reach. My hand rested on a pool of blood around her head. Ed, I whispered, Ed, please wake up. Oh God, please don't be dead. What? She moaned. We gotta get out of here, Ed. Okay, she said. You pull the car up. Don't make me laugh, I told her. I can hardly breathe. I passed out again. Darlene told us later that a family on their way to church found us. They got some people to help get us into their homes nearby. They didn't take us to the hospital because they didn't know if we were in trouble with the law or not. When Edwin came to, she gave them Darlene's number. Darlene and her friends came to get and got us. Darlene took care of both of us at their apartment for a week before Ed or I were really coherent. Where's Ed? Is she okay? Was the first thing I remembered asking Darlene. That's the first thing she asked me. How you were, Darlene answered. Alive. You're both alive, you stupid motherfuckers. Neither of us ever saw an emergency room doctor for fear that they'd call the cops to see if we were in any trouble. When Ed and I could, s could sit up and even walk a little, we began recuperating. We began recuperating in the living room together during the days while Darlene slept. The couch opened up as a bed. Ed gave me The Ballot and the Bullet by Malcolm X. She encouraged me to read W.E.D. Dubois and James Baldwin, but we each had a headache so bad that we could hardly read the newspaper. All day long, we lay next to each other and watched television. Get Smart, The Beverly Hillbillies, Green Acres. We healed in spite of it. Ed got disability pay during her absence. I lost my job as a printer. When Ed and I finally showed up at the Malibu a month later, someone pulled the plug on the jukebox and everyone rushed up to hug us. No, wait, gently, we shouted, both backing up towards the door. Notice the resemblance, I asked as Red and I, Ed and I put our faces near each other. We had matching gashes over our right eyebrows. Speaking for myself, I lost a lot of confidence after that beating. The pain in my rib cage reminded me with every breath how vulnerable I really was. I propped myself up at the back table and watched all my friends dancing together. It felt good to be back home. Peaches sat down next to me, draped her arm around my shoulder, and planted a long sweet kiss on my cheek. Cookie offered me a job as a bouncer on the weekends. I held my ribs and winced. She said I could wait on the tables until I healed if I wanted to. I sure needed the money. I watched Justine, a stunning drag queen, going from table to table with an empty Maxwell House coffee can collecting money. She came over to the table where Peaches and I were sitting and began counting out the bills. You don't have to contribute, Arlen. What's it for, I asked. For your new suit, she answered and continued counting the bills. Whose new suit? Your new suit, honey. You can't expect to be the master of ceremonies of the Monte Carlo night drag show extravaganza in that tacky old outfit, do you? I looked bewildered. We're taking you out and buying you a new suit, Peaches explained. You're going to MC the drag show next month. That's what I just told you, Justine sounded annoyed. I don't know how to be an MC. Don't worry, darling, Justine laughed. You're not the star. Peaches threw her head back. We are. But you're going to look divine, Justine said, waving a wad of bills. I had heard horror stories about butches and their femmes trying to shop for suits, at Clint Hands clothing store. But this time, Clint Hands was in for some discomfort as three powerful queens in full drag helped me pick it out. No, Justine shook her head empathetically. She's an MC, not a fucking undertaker. Earth tones, Georgette turned my face in her hands because of her coloring. No, 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 Bisha said. This is it. She held up a dark blue gabardine suit. Yes, Justine sighed as I came out of the dressing room. Yes. Oh, honey, it just might swing for you, Georgette exclaimed. Peaches fussed with my lapels. Yes, yes, yes. We'll take it, Georgette told the salesman. He looked visibly annoyed. 
tailor it for the child, and make it look nice. The salesman pulled out the tape measure from around his neck and tried to chalk the trousers and jacket without touching me. Finally, he straightened up. You can pick it up in one week, he announced. We can pick it up today, Georgette declared. We'll just walk around the store trying things on until it's ready. No, the salesman blurted. Come back in two hours. Just leave now. Just leave. We'll be back in an hour, darling, Justine said over her shoulder. See you, Georgette blew him a kiss. Come on, Peaches waved for me to follow. It's our turn. They steered me towards the store next door. We were headed for the lingerie department. I shook my head. I gotta use the bathroom. God, I wish I could wait, but I can't. Justine touched my cheek. Sorry, darling. Peaches drew herself up to her full height. Come on, we'll all go in together with her. No, I held up both my hands. I'm afraid we'll all get busted. My bladder ached. I wish I hadn't waited so long. I took a deep breath and pushed the door to the woman's bathroom. Two women were freshening their makeup in front of the mirror. One glanced at the other and finished applying her lipstick. Is that a man or a woman? She said to her friend as I passed them. The other woman turned to me. This is the woman's bathroom, she informed me. I nodded. I know. I locked the stall door behind me. Their laughter cut me to the bone. You don't really know if that's a man or not, one woman said to the other. We should call security just to make sure. I flushed the toilet and fumbled with my zipper in fear. Maybe it was just an idle threat. Maybe they would really call security. I hurried out of the bathroom as soon as I heard both women leave. You okay, darling? Justine asked. I nodded. She smiled. You took ten years off those girls' lives. I forced myself to smile. Nah, they never would have made fun of a guy like that. I was afraid they might call the cops on me. They took ten years out of my life. Come on. Peaches impatiently tugged on my sleeve. It's high femme time. She dragged me toward the lingerie department. What do you think? Georgette held up a red silk nightie. Black, I told her. The black lace one. Lord, that's boys got taste, she said. Peaches sighed. It's funny seeing you trying on that suit, all excited and everything. I remember my father making me buy a suit for Sunday service. When I dreamed of dressing up, child, it was no suit, I'll tell you that much. I dreamed about something, you know, tasteful, with spaghetti straps, kind of low-cut. She drew her finger across her bodice. I felt like a ballerina in a three-piece suit. Georgette snorted, more like a fairy. Peaches threw back her head and dragged me away. We went to the Kalenheins an hour later. The suit was ready. We have enough money left over to pick out a suit, shirt, and tie, Georgette announced. Justine held out a powdered blue dress shirt. It was more beautiful than any shirt my father ever owned. The buttons were sky blue, with white swirls, like clouds. Peaches and Georgette settled on a burgundy silk tie. The salesmen held their heads in their hands as though they had all had headaches. Well, better them than us. I can't thank you all enough, I told them. Yes, you can, honey. You best pick me at the winner at the drag show. She can see I'm the fairest of them all. Oh, please, child, don't make me laugh. I held up both my hands. Wait, I protested. You never told me I was going to judge the drag show. Well, darling, Justine smiled. It's a month away. Don't you worry your handsome little head about it. The month passed quickly. I tried to avo avoid all squabbles between contestants over how the show should be run. I arrived at the Malibu a little late the night of the show. I took off my helmet and sat on my Norton in the back parking lot smoking a cigarette. Child, where have you been? Peaches demanded as she rocked from side to side in her high heels on the gravel. I'm coming, I shouted, grinding out my cigarette. I'll be right there. Everyone stopped and stared as I walked in the door. You look good enough to eat, Peaches said, smoothing my lapels. Georgette clasped her hands in front of her. I think I'm falling in love. Yeah, she says that after every blowjob, Justine muttered. Cookie went over the program with me. I chewed on my thumbnail as she spoke. I'd spent my whole life wishing I could be invisible. How was I going to climb up on that stage with a spotlight on me? When I got up, got up on the runway, it was dark in the club. After the spotlight hit me, I could hardly see the crowd. Sing something, one of the butchers shouted. What do I look like, fucking Burt Parks? I yelled back. Okay, I began to sing, here comes the miscellaneous. Boo! Listen up now, I pleaded. This is serious. 
This ain't serious. This is a drag show, someone yelled. Yeah, I said, this is serious. I realized what I wanted to say. You know, all our lives they told us the way we are isn't right. I heard some murmurs. Yeah, well, this is our home. We're family. There was a ripple of applause from the audience. You're goddamn right, one of the drag queens behind me shouted. So tonight we're going to celebrate the way we are. It's not only okay, it's beautiful. And I want you all to make your gorgeous sisters in this show feel how much we love and respect them. The crowd war roared in approval. Justine and Peaches ran out and kissed me, and then ran backstage to await their cues. I flipped through the index cards Cookie had given me. Will you please welcome tonight Miss Deanna Rose singing Stop in the Name of Love. The music swelled. I stepped aside. Beach's dress shimmered. The spotlight illuminated her. What a breathtakingly beautiful human being. Stop in the name of love. She grabbed a fistful of my tie as she sang. For you break my heart. Her lips were close to mine. I gasped caught up in the power of her performance. The applause was tremendous. Get the kid a towel, someone yelled as I wiped my forehead with the back of my hand. Will you please welcome Miss Barbara Lewis singing Hello Stranger. Justine walked straight toward me, slow, absolutely steady on her spiked heels as the music rose. Hello Stranger, she draped one arm over my shoulder. It seems like a mighty long time. I could get to like this. The next performer was Georgette's boyfriend, Booker. I'd never seen Booker try on drag before. Even in a dress, I still thought of Booker as he. Booker was also doing Stop in the Name of the Love. Georgette peeked out from behind the stage wall to watch. Wouldn't you just know it, she whispered to me. You think you married a real man and you find out you've got a sister who borrows your lipstick and won't return it. I chuckled. Lord have mercy, she said. That girl's in trouble. The step on Booker's dress slipped down every time he lifted his arms to sing stop. It could have been very sexy, but he was so nervous he kept trying to hike up the strap. Help her, Georgette said to me. I handed Georgette the mic and walked out on stage in front of Booker. I got down in one knee in front of him and pretended he was singing to me. Then I circled behind him and pulled down his strap seductively. Leave it, I whispered as I kissed his shoulder. Booker pushed me away dramatically, singing Before You Break My Heart. The crowd roared in approval. Everyone was really enjoying the way Booker was pulling off this act. None of us saw the red lights flashing. The music died and everyone groaned. Then the police flooded into the club. I held my hands up to shield my eyes from the spotlight, but I still couldn't see what was happening. I heard shouting and tables and chairs overturning. I remembered there was only one door. There was no escape this time. At 16 years old, I was still underage. I slowly took off my new blue suit coat, folded it neatly, and put it on the piano at the back of the stage. For a moment, I considered taking off my tie, thinking somehow it might go easier for me if I did. But of course, it wouldn't have. In fact, the tie made me feel stronger in order to face whatever lay ahead of me. I rolled up my sleeves and stepped off the stage. A cop grabbed me and cuffed my hands tightly behind my back. Another cop was smacking Booker, who was sobbing. The police van was backed right up to the door of the club. The cops roughed us up as they shoved us in. Some of the drag queens bantered nervously on the way to the precinct, making jokes to relieve the tension. I rode in silence. We were all put together in one huge holding cell. My cuffed hands felt swollen and cold from lack of circulation. I waited in the cell. Two cops opened the door. They were laughing and talking to themselves. I wasn't listening. What do you want, a fucking invitation? Now, one of them commanded. Come on, Jesse, a cop taunted me. Let's have a pretty smile for the camera. You're such a pretty girl. Isn't she pretty, guys? They snapped my mugshot. One of the cops loosened my tie. As he ripped open my new dress shirt, the sky blue buttons bounced and rolled across the floor. He pulled up my t-shirt, exposing my breasts. My hands were cuffed behind my back. I was flat up against the wall. I don't think she likes you, Gary, another cop said. Maybe she'll like me better. He crossed the room. My knees were wobbling. Lieutenant Mul Mulroney, that's what his badge read. 
He saw me looking at it and slapped me hard across the face. His hands clamped on my face like a vice. Suck my cock, he said quietly. There wasn't a sound in the room. I didn't move. No one said anything. I almost got the feeling it could stay that way. All action frozen, but it didn't. Mulroney was fingering his crotch. Suck my cock, bull dagger. Someone hit the side of my knees with a nightstick. My knees buckled more from fear than pain. Moroni grabbed me by the collar and dragged me several feet away to the steel toilet. There was a piece of unflushed shit floating in the water. Either eat me or eat my shit, bull dagger. It's up to you. I was too frightened to think or move. I held my breath the first time he shoved my head in the toilet. The second time he held me under so long, I sucked in water and felt the hard shape of the shit against my tongue. When Mulroney pulled my head back out of the toilet, I spewed vomit all over him. I gagged and retched over and over again. Ah, shit. Fuck. Get out of, Get her out of here, the cops yelled at each other as I lay heaving. No, Mulroney said. Handcuff her over there on top of the desk. They lifted me and threw me on my back across the desk and handcuffed my hands over my head. As one cop pulled off my trousers, I tried to calm I tried to calm the spasms in my stomach so I wouldn't choke to death on my own vomit. Ah, ain't that cute. BVDs, one cop called out to the other. Fucking pervert. I looked at the light on the ceiling, a large yellow bulb burning behind a metal mesh. The light reminded me of the endless scream stream of television westerns I saw after we moved up north. Whatever anyone was lost in the desert, the only image showed was a glaring sun, all the beauty of the desert reduced to that one impression. Staring at the jail light bulb rescued me from watching my own degradation. I just went away. I found myself standing in the desert. The sky was streaked with color. Every shift of light cast a different hue across the wilderness. Salmon, rose, lavender, the scent of sage was overpowering. Even before I saw the golden eagle gliding up the updraft above me, I heard it scream. As clearly as it had come from my own throat, I longed to soar in flight with the eagle, but I felt rooted to the earth. The mountains rose to meet me. I walked toward them, seeking sanctuary, but something held me back. Fuck it, Maloney spat. Turn her over. Her cunt's too fucking loose. Jeez, Lieutenant, how come these fucking bull daggers don't fuck men, and they got such big cunts? Ask your wife, Mulroney said. The other cops laughed. I panicked. I tried to return to the desert, but I couldn't find that floating opening between the dimensions. I'd passed through before. An explosion of pain in my body catapulted me back. I was standing on the desert floor again, but this time the sand had cooled. The sky was overcast, threatening to storm. The air pressure was unbearable. It was hard to breathe. From a distance, I heard the eagle scream again. The sky was growing as dark as the mountains. Wind blew through my hair. I closed my eyes and turned my face up to the desert sky, and then finally it released and what the welcome relief of warm rain down my cheeks.